Yo, what's up, everybody? It's Wednesday, October 5th. I didn't get a chance to make a video yesterday. Um, so the news today, at least uh, one big piece of news was the OPEC Plus meeting that concluded a couple hours ago. And the group decided to go with a 2 million barrel a day price. That's big, 2 million barrel a day price cut. Although I'm seeing some commentary now from some uh, oil analysts saying it's not really going to be two million because um, it's like a reduction from their quota or something. I don't know. But um, that price cut was larger than what was initially kind of floated. And it is going to remain in place for a year, folks. A year. That's a long time. I mean, it goes from November of this year until December of 2023. And um, I think it's going to have a significantly bullish impact, a significant bullish impact on the oil market. We saw initially a dip when the announcement first came out. And then uh, right now, as I speak, oil is up a little bit. Uh, it does look like, and I'm not the only one, um, kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of putting out this, this idea, but it does look like the group is very much aware of the G7 uh, intention to put a price cap on Russian oil. And it seems like this 2 million barrel a day cut is their effort to offset the two mil the um, price cap on oil. In other words, they're saying, "Hey, you know, it, it's us uh, that is going to determine market prices, not the G7 in their price cap." So I think what they're trying to do here, and and for me, this move was blatantly political. Uh, the United States Biden administration has been doing a lot of public relations and pressuring the, the Saudis not to put through this price cut. But at the same time, the Biden administration and the G7, of course, which the United States is, is a main member, uh, they are going ahead with that intended price cap on Russian oil. So it looks like the Saudis, it looks like OPEC plus is saying, you know, that that's not happening under our watch. We will do what it takes to put a floor under prices. It's going to be interesting, though, because it's going to be the price cap versus the output cuts by OPEC. So. Um, we don't know how that's going to play out right now. I, I, um, I'm inclined to believe that uh, OPEC is going to win out uh, simply because uh, Russia is just not going to sell to any countries that are imposing price caps. So there's going to be significant shortages, I think, developing in those countries that will be excluded from Russian supply. Uh, today's EIA report, the weekly EIA uh, petroleum status report came out. We had draws in uh, crude, gasoline, and distillate. Actually, the gasoline and distillate draws were pretty big. This was the second weekly draw in crude oil. And by the way, that draw came even with, I think we had something like a 6.2 million. It might've been higher. It might've been 6.9 million, but I know it was like a 6 million something release in the SPR. By the way, the SPR releases are supposed to end at the end of this month, at the end of October. And at some point, the United States is going to want to refill the strategic petroleum reserve, which means that, uh, you know, the U.S. will become a buyer whereas it has been a seller since, uh, I don't know, when did they start this? Back in, in July or August, I forget. Uh, but those SPR releases, as far as I know, that's what's been reported, is going to end at the end of this month. So a lot of things, um, new, new developments, I would say, in the energy markets. And of course, you have the situation with 
Nord Stream. Uh, that is that is done, okay? And that was obviously uh, the United States, or at least the United States took part in blowing that up. I mean, the idea that Russia blew up its own energy infrastructure, which, you know, it relies on for uh, currency. I, I mean, that, that just doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, I listened to uh, one retired um, senator and all who was also a prosecutor and you know you need you need motive you need capability and you need opportunity the motive was clearly there to punish russia and there's another motive too that i'll get into capability uh it had to be a a, a state actor and only a few would have the capability of doing that the united states clearly has the capability of doing that and opportunity, the opportunity was there to do it. Uh, leading up to the sabotage of Nord Stream, we were starting to see protests in Europe. There were protests in Germany. There were protests in Sweden, uh, protests in France uh, on the uh, high cost of energy and the ongoing sanctions against Russia. In other words, the general population in these countries we're starting to rise up and to say that, look, we are against these policies. We do not want these policies. We are not for these sanctions anymore. They are hurting us economically. They are hurting us socially. And uh, this was starting to put pressure on governments in these respective countries. And the United States, it seems pretty obvious to me, uh, saw um, a way to diffuse or end these protests uh, by destroying uh, the gas supply or the potential gas supply because what the protest, the pressure from the protest uh, appeared to be leading to a softening of the position of the German government uh, and other governments in Europe towards Russia and the sanctions where they were getting closer to making a deal on, um, you know, getting once again access to that gas supply. And by blowing up the pipelines, essentially Washington effectively crushed the protest or took away um, you know, the, the intent of the protest, you can't get the gas anymore. We blew up the pipeline, so you cannot get the gas. So stop protesting, go home and freeze. You know, we will have no protests. Oh, I thought it was a democracy. I thought, you know, we're going to listen to the will of the people. Uh-uh. You listen to the will of Washington. If Washington says you have no gas and you freeze because we must do this against Russia. Everything else is out of the question. The will of the people is out of the question. Uh, democratic processes are out of the question. Who voted for this stuff? Nobody voted for this stuff. This was a, a, a diktat from Washington saying to Europe, you know, this is what you have to do. And if you're not going to play along, and if you think you're going to make some kind of deal with Russia to get this gas, guess what? We're going to blow up the pipelines so, you know, it's going to be your protests are going to be like moot. They're going to be, uh, you know, accomplishing nothing because you cannot get the gas because we blew up the pipelines. So what's going to happen now? We're going to have U.S. LNG, liquefied natural gas, going to be exported over to Europe, which is going to cause U.S. Uh, gas prices to shoot up. We now have um, OPEC cutting production by 2 million barrels a day in an environment where we already see low inventories of oil, of crude, of uh, refined products, all right? And, and crude, mind you, it's only where it is right now, which is about flat year over year. Uh, inventories are maybe, you know, slightly up in the single digits year over year. But that's because we've had an unprecedented draw in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And like I said earlier, that's going to end, okay? 
that's going to end. And the U.S. is going to want to refill the strategic petroleum reserve at some point. So, I mean, uh, the government's going to go from being a seller of its oil to a buyer of its oil. By the way, a lot of that's being exported. I did look, here's another thing, um, U.S. net exports, I mean, they're blowing through the roof. This is to me, and I've raised this issue a number of times, uh, where I said one of the easiest things that Biden could do right now to at least take some pressure off of domestic prices is that he could put a moratorium on um, petroleum exports. Nothing, nothing. Petroleum exports were started under Trump and Trump really pushed for it because, you know, he, he believed like we got to sell our oil to make money for the government. We got to make money. Like, again, thinking like the government is a profit seeking enterprise. And you could see the evolution starting from zero. It was illegal. It was banned. Petroleum exports were banned in the United States for, you know, 50 years. And then as soon as we started opening up exports, it was like just a linear progression. Exports kept building and building and building. I think in this latest week, if I'm not mistaken, it was something like uh, net exports of 3.7 million barrels a day, almost 4 million barrels a day net exports of crude and petroleum products. I mean, you're literally, that was supposed to be our energy independence, right? I mean, Trump talked about that a lot. He opened up drilling in the Arctic National Wilderness and also in uh, Western lands, uh, offshore leases. That's going to be our energy independence. I am making America energy independent. But what happened? We're selling it off. We're selling it off as exports. Foreigners are getting that bounty, not the United States. So it's going to be a very interesting winter uh, with the uh, OPEC production cuts with the um, inoperability of Nord Stream. I mean, Nord Stream is finished, no gas for Europe, or it's gonna be our LNG that's gonna be shipped over there. And that's not gonna be enough. Our LNG going over to Germany or wherever is, is not gonna be enough. Uh, so it's gonna be very interesting, but the potential for a, a major bull market in energy uh, markets is, is definitely there. I mean, you got to admit that that is definitely there. Um, I have also been noticing a lot of uh, mounting criticism uh, towards the Fed's ongoing rate increases. Now, now, me personally, as I view this from an MMT perspective, uh, I mean, I'm not bothered by rate increases because I understand that you know, there's two sides to the issue. One side, obviously, is you're raising the price structure by raising in, uh, interest rates. So you're literally um, setting the floor for prices. If you want to uh, substitute uh, the word prices, if you want to put inflation in there, you're literally raising the floor. Uh, but the other thing, the, the flip side of that is you are increasing net interest income flows into the economy. And it's something that I've been talking about now for a long time. And these flows are really just starting to get going. I mean, we're going to have elevated levels of interest income flows for a long period of time. As these uh, government securities mature, and the new ones get issued with a higher coupon, that means a higher interest rate, uh, you know, and they stay earning interest, you know, over the, over the term. I mean, we're going to have elevated levels of interest income flows for a prolonged period of time. And, I, you know, I see that. It's not just that I see that as a bullish thing. I mean, we are still seeing, remember, all these interest rate increases if you followed along with the narrative, was supposed to bring a terrible recession. We are not seeing any evidence of that. Even today, we got the ADP payroll. By the way, Friday, we're going to get the government's payroll report. 
The ADP payroll report was 208,000 for September. That beat the forecast of 200,000. All right, you might say, well, that's not a big beat, 8,000, but still the point is it beat the forecast. It's doing better than the forecast. And we continue to see that in the economic data. We continue to see that demand. Oh, here's another thing. In today's EIA petroleum report, a big increase in gasoline demand. We went from like 8.8 .8 million barrels a day up to 9.4 million barrels a day. I mean, that is really strong demand, all right? So I don't see any evidence right now of um, rates impacting demand, none. And we're not going to get a recession with demand being sustained now. And again, we're still in the very early stages of these interest income flows I just don't see a recession. As a matter of fact, I, you know, it's not just me. I mean, you look at the forecast from, uh, what is it, the blue chip consensus and the uh, Atlanta Fed's uh, GDP now, you know, just in the last two weeks, they went from third quarter GDP at 0.3%. Now it's up to like 2.4%. I mean, they're revising their GDP estimates up, not down. So, I mean, what more do you need to see? Gasoline demand, 9.4 million barrels a day. Folks, that is strong. That is really, really strong. Uh, we got a draw, a drawdown in crude oil inventories in a week that saw, you know, what, six, six and a half million release, barrel release from the SPR and, and, um, a decline in crude oil exports, a small decline, but the point is crude oil exports came down, all right? So you would think we'd get like maybe a build in crude inventories. No, we got to draw. We got to draw. Refinery, refiner inputs were up. I mean, across the board, if you look at barometers of demand, I just don't see I just don't see any flagging in demand whatsoever. I just don't. Look at credit demand. And again, I know people here have commented, "Oh, Mike, of course credit demand because people have to max out their credit cards." Let me tell you something. Credit card loans, credit card and revolving credit is a small percentage of loans and leases at commercial banks, okay? Small it's like um, eight eight hundred billion or something like that, um, and loans are like eleven something trillion. So I mean, you can't. And, and again, if you're gonna, you know, you need to qualify for credit. I've been through this so many times. Simply because you need money. It's not a condition where banks are just going to give you money ordinarily anyway. Simply because you need money is not, especially an unsecured loan like a credit card. Real estate, maybe you could argue that banks, you know, get ahead of themselves sometimes, but that's because they have an asset to lend against. That is the property itself. All right. And, you know, if you want to argue, oh, yeah, but they overinflated. OK, that's a whole separate thing. But, you know, when it comes to credit cards, that's just a small fraction of overall loans. Loans are going up on commercial and industrial loans. They're going up on real estate loans. They're going up across the whole spectrum of loans, the whole entire spectrum of loan. Credit demand is strong. There's another element in uh, this concept of credit demand. And that element is the fact that in general, especially when it comes to commercial and industrial loans. Those are loans going to corporations, to big, to business, you know, maybe to finance inventory, maybe to finance an expansion of the business, something of that nature. There has to be a motive, a reason to uh, seek out more credit. And that reason has to be justified economically. In other words, a business wants to expand. A business needs to finance more inventory because it, it sees demand. 
I mean, again, this is a, this is an indication. If you look at commercial and industrial loans, and again, that's like three trillion that dwarfs credit cards and revolving credit. I mean, that has been going up steadily, and that's a function of demand. I mean, businesses are replenishing inventory because they see demand picking up. We saw it in, in some of these recent surveys like the ISM and other surveys that show, for example, uh, new orders, the new orders component of these surveys. It's going up. They're in expansion territory. So nothing here pointing to recession. We have jitters over uh, rate increases. Yeah, that's been a that's been a feature since early this year. And every time the Fed says something, you know, the market goes down on that. But it's buoyant. It, you know, whenever you get positive. By the way, I would I would argue and I have been arguing and you know this, that the real reason for the decline in the stock market this year. And I said this in my last video was the massive, unprecedented $2 trillion reduction in fiscal support. That's 10% of GDP just shut down, taken away, literally in a few months. Now, if you can't connect the dots there and understand that when you remove a factor that is that large and that important, and if you think that has no bearing on, you know, what the stock market is going to do, because, of course, the stock market is going to uh, reflect uh, corporate profits and the outlook for corporate profits. When you take off 10, this, you know, on a nominal, in nominal terms, this was, this broke every single record that ever existed. Two trillion taken away like that. That is the reason for the weakness in the stock market this year. The fact that we went from 0% to a 3%, oh my God, a 3% interest rate. Come on, people, get real. But when you take away, literally, look, G, uh, uh, government spending is the second biggest component of GDP. When you take away 10% of GDP, your GDP, your economy shrinks by 10%, shrinks by 10%. That's what happened. Don't start to concoct, you know, other reasons because every crazy monetarist zombie is telling you that. It's very, very easy to understand. So that's where we are right now. I think very interesting, uh, the energy situation going into the winter, got to keep an eye on it. Anyway, so uh, that's it for, for now. Maybe I'll see you later. Bye.